So as John said, I'm here to talk about functional effects for everyone. And the premise of this talk is really, I think we're all here because we know that functional effects are great, that we get a lot out of them every day using them. They give us superpowers to, in our day-to-day -day work, we have someone come to us and says, well, I need you to do this thing. And they think, well, maybe this is gonna take a day, maybe this is a week-long project. And we're like, that's fine, we'll knock it out for you in an hour. That's what functional effects give us. They let us solve these very hard concurrency problems where we're worried about, well, we gotta do a bunch of things in parallel, we need to interrupt them, we need to have resource safety, we need to have all this stuff, and that just comes together for us almost effortlessly by using these operators and just lets us be a lot more productive and lets us build these complex systems from much simpler components where we can reason about each of these parts and then the parts fit together in just the right way to build the more complex solution that we need. So functional effects are great, but we might ask ourselves, well, if they're so great, why isn't everyone using them? I think a lot of us are lucky enough to be in organizations where we get to do Scala, get to do functional Scala, but we probably have to acknowledge there's a subset of organizations that use that, and there's a lot of organizations that don't. And even within the organizations that do, a lot of times we have our little island of Scala or functional Scala development within this broader realm of Python and of Java and of much more imperative and object-oriented programming. And even a ton of Scala developers are using tools that are not functional, which, you know, great, use what works for you, but we might ask ourselves a little bit if what we're doing is so fantastic, why isn't everyone lined up to do it? And I think there are two approaches you can take to answering that question. So one is what you could call looking outward, which is if you have a problem in a relationship, it's not me, it's you, of kind of looking at other people and saying, well, there's something about them that they need to do differently, and if they just did, then they would appreciate how great all of this stuff is. So I think the most common version of this is this idea that, well, people just need to learn, right? If they just go in and they looked at learn yourself a Haskell for greater good or what have you, then they would realize how wonderful all this is and then they would say, oh, everything you're doing is so fantastic and let me just do this. And there's another version of this that says, well, maybe some people don't care about writing good code. Maybe there's kind of, well, we're like back-end folks and we really need things to be correct, but there's a bunch of folks who don't care as much about writing correct software and then, well, that's why they're not using it. Or there's another version that says, well, people get misled by marketing, of, ah, oh, there's all this slick marketing, and if they look through that, then they would just see how what we're doing is perfect and fantastic. But I, I think all of those really, again, going back to the relationship, what is gonna lead you to success is not blaming the other person, but is looking inward and saying, well, what did I do to contribute to this, and what can I do better? And so the way that we can do that here is we can ask ourselves, what do we do when we create these functional effect libraries when we work with them that makes them less accessible? And we can ask ourselves that in, I think, maybe two broad categories. One could be a little bit softer of the communities we build. What do we do in our interactions with each other? And the second category would be a little bit more technical of what do we do in the code we write and how we write it. And there's probably a little bit of a fuzzy line between those two, but I'll try to divide the world up into those two categories a little bit. And the first category, what we do in the communities we build, I'm actually not gonna spend a ton of time on because I don't know if I have a lot new to say about it. I think it's really doing the things that probably our parents told us to do a long time ago. It's treating each other with professionalism. It's welcoming newcomers. It's accepting and internalizing feedback instead of blaming people when they say, well, this isn't working for me. So I think those are things we can all hopefully, hopefully are already doing, can all hopefully maybe take a minute to recommit ourselves to, but I'm also not sure I have a whole lot of, to say beyond just we should do those things. So I'm just gonna leave that at there, but I don't wanna lose at all the importance of those things. The second aspect of it is the software we write. 
And one of the ways I find is helpful to think about this is this concept of what I call the learning staircase. And so I, I took this image from the programming Scala book that Martin Oderski and some other folks did, which is a great introduction to language. And I think the staircase is a pretty helpful analogy because if you think about the staircase, every step of that staircase, you can be safe and productive. You can climb up that staircase, you can get halfway, and you can look at your phone, you can look at a view, you can have a conversation with your colleague. You're not over here on the hillside where if you just stop for a sec, you may fall down. And we also get to learn incrementally what we need to know. It's a staircase, it's not a cliff. If I want to take a step up, then I just get to take a step. It's not like, well, the next step is up there, you better get some climbing gear and get ready to go. And as we step up, we learn more and more and we get a higher and higher vantage point, but we don't have to be at the, stop of this, at the top of the staircase to be productive and to be working with this language or this framework that we're using. And so I think that's a really helpful set of principles to think about when talking about either functional effects or really software in general and making it more accessible to folks. So where are some areas where maybe we, maybe we make things not as accessible there? Well, the first one, I think, is actually referential transparency. So how many of you have seen a chart like this one? Right, we get the, yeah, yeah, lots of, right, tons of talks, we get the like points getting mapped to other points, we see, okay, they're all in there, or maybe this is some modern art version of a guitar, but okay, got it, we got this kind of function going from one thing to another. Or how about this one? We've got the future referential transparency example, right? We like, we do the for comprehension and we print something twice and we see it gets printed twice and then we try extracting it into a variable, but oh no, now it only gets printed once. It's not referentially transparent, right? So we all seen these probably a ton of times, a ton of talks, probably not necessarily talks about referential transparency, but talks about error handling or talks about actors in Zio of, you wanna learn this? Well, let me tell you about this other thing. And I think this is one of those cases where, on the one hand, distinguishing, describing from doing is really important. That's a, that's a key idea behind Zio, behind a lot of what we do in functional programming. But at the same time, we've got to acknowledge that every new concept has a cost. And this is a case where someone's asking us of, how do I do error handling in Zio? And we say, well, let me tell you about referential transparency. And just the fact that we kind of do that, we're creating two steps that you have to climb instead of one. And that's not the end of the world. Sometimes we need to build knowledge on top of knowledge, but we really got to ask ourselves, is there ways that we can minimize when we have to do that? And so to think about this, you can look at the traditional approach to how you would do this referential transparency and you say, okay, well, we have this very strong distinction between we have our pure mathy methods, we have our two plus two, and then we have our side effecting methods, we have our print lines, and we have different operators for them. So when we just do math things, at least in this framework, we call it pure, and when we do side effecting things, we call it delay, and so we've got these two different things and we've got these two different tools. And one of the things I want us to think about today is the idea of a solution versus a dissolution. So a solution to a problem breaks the world down into different categories. It says the world's complex, the world has these different categories, and I'm gonna give you different tools for each of them. And hopefully if this is a good solution, those tools are gonna fit together to solve the full range of problems you have here. So in this case, the saying the world's complex and that there are these side effecting and non-side effecting things, I'm giving you these two tools of these two constructors, you need to identify them and use them appropriately. And so solutions have definite advantages. They tell us something about the world, if they're, at least if they're insightful solutions, right? In this case, it told us that the world had these two types of things that were pure and not pure. And they allow us to solve our problems. If here we said, okay, well we now have a tool to manage things that 
are doing side effects by putting them into this delay constructor. And we get to have a lot of specificity in describing how we're doing them. We can say, well, okay, this is a mathy thing, so I'm gonna use pure, this is a side affecting thing, I'm gonna use delay. Okay, that's all, that's all good. What are some of the disadvantages of a solution like that? Well, it requires us to distinguish those different types of situations in the world. We now have to look at everything in the world and we have to say, is this a pure thing or is this a side affecting thing? And then we need to choose the appropriate tool and we need to keep in our heads, okay, how are we categorizing all these things and are we using the appropriate tool? And are we using these tools in the right way? And this can create problems for us. So here's an example where we've got two methods here that are both going to produce a, or are gonna return a Kafka producer record. And the only difference between them is that one of them is gonna use this pure constructor and one of them is gonna use this delay constructor. And in this case, we're going to take each of these and we're gonna compose them into a larger operator that's going to retry this if we're not successful doing this and is gonna write something to the headers. And it turns out that one of these, if I do the first one, it's actually gonna throw an illegal state exception. Anyone know why that would be? Well, turns out this producer record is actually in some ways a mutable structure. If we can write to these headers and it doesn't just return a new producer record, it updates that producer record in place. And that producer record can be in a state where it is read only. And so if we inadvertently use this constructor instead of this constructor, then we end up trying to write the headers to the same record instead of creating a new record each time. And this is a kind of subtle error that we can make that like really makes us think like, oh, we can like shoot ourselves in the foot if we don't really understand what this distinction is and exactly which thing is supposed to fit into which of these buckets. So here's the Zio approach, the same problem. It's exactly the same. They're both Zio succeed. And so the Zio approach is make everything lazy, has minimal performance impact, and it eliminates a whole class of bugs. And so the, the fun way I like to think about it is you don't have to worry as much about what a side effect is, which things are side effect or not, if you put everything into Zio succeed. And so as opposed to a solution, this really represents a dissolution of the problem. Instead of giving you the tools to solve this problem, this just makes the problem go away for you. It says the world may be complex in this way, but you don't have to worry about this complexity because we're gonna handle it for you. Things can be different in this way, don't worry so much about it, we'll take care of that. And then you can reason at a higher level of you don't have to worry so much about, well, is this particular method side effecting or not? You get to go on and solve the rest of the problems you wanna solve. And so what are the advantages of a dissolution? So as we just said, it lets you focus on the problem you're trying to solve. The problem people are trying to solve was probably not distinguishing side affecting versus not side affecting methods. It's writing something to Kafka or writing some data flow process or doing something else. It's easier learning. It's essentially one fewer thing you need to know. So if you think about that learning staircase and you think about what you need to learn, in the Zio world, you still need to, still definitely good to have some concept of describing versus doing, but it can be a little bit more conceptual. We can say it's a workflow, it's a description, and that'll largely get you where you need to go versus if you're in the world where every operator, you really need to distinguish which one is side effecting, which one is not, and if you get it wrong, you're gonna introduce bugs, you've gotta be really careful. You better make sure you watch a lecture about this and quiz yourself and do some of these puzzlers before you're really good to go on this. And it just creates fewer opportunities for mistakes. It's just kind of eliminated a whole class of bugs when we moved to doing this, and this was actually originally in Z01, and is done even more broadly in Zio 2.0, where it's not just Zio succeed, but it's basically every operator in Zio 
is lazy like that. So you don't need to worry so much about what is side effecting or what's not. It's definitely a great thing to know. It's definitely gonna kind of empower you and make you a better programmer, but you don't need it to be safe and productive as you're getting started and as you're on that learning staircase. What are some of the disadvantages of dissolution? Well, it typically shifts complexity to library authors. There is this underlying complexity that exists in the world that has to be managed somehow. There are things that are pure that we can do over and over again as much as we want, it's the same, versus there are things where it's different if we print it once or print it twice. And that has to be managed somewhere, but if we shift it to library authors, that's typically a better source of bearing the cost of that complexity. Library authors are better positioned to bear that cost. And it may involve some trade-offs. So like in this case, there is some small performance cost to making everything lazy because you wrap it in an additional function zero. But the reality is that if you're doing IO effects, that's not gonna be material. And if you're worried about a function zero allocation, you shouldn't be using this at all. You should be using very low level array operators and wrapping that up in a larger functionally pure representation. And it's also typically more opinionated. Instead of just saying, well, I'm gonna give you the tools and you can use those tools to solve the problem however you want, I'm saying, here's how I think the best way is to solve the problem. And I think overall that's good, but you definitely have a set of people who say, well, no, 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 I, I don't want you to be opinionated. So if dissolutions are so interesting, how do we get to them? Why, why can it be challenging to get to them? Well, the first step to really dissolving a problem is typically solving it. So one of the things we'll see as we go through some of the other examples here is in almost every case, we solve the problem first, and that was a step on the way to us dissolving the problem because solving the problem actually gives us the tools to solve it, but then we kind of take the next step and we say, well, what our users really want is they just want to not deal with this problem at all. They don't want the tools. We can use the tools, but they don't need to use the tools because we're gonna use the tools to just make this problem go away. The next step to solving it is challenging the premises that underlie the solution. So typically, when we come up with a solution, implicit in that is some idea that the world is different and complex in this way, and that it is irreducibly complex, that there's no way to put these things, these different things, and treat them in the same way. So even going back to this example about this strictness and laziness, there was this implicit assumption that, well, because of performance, we have to treat these differently. And as long as the assumption's implicit, then it's easy to not really question it. And so really it's surfacing it that then gives us the ability to say, well, okay, you say that performance is the reason, how, what's the performance difference? How large is it? Does it really apply here? If you really cared about performance, would you be doing something different? And that's something we're gonna keep coming back to as we go on here. We're gonna see how challenging these premises lets us get to better answers and lets us go from having a solution to actually dissolving a problem entirely. And finally, it requires putting egos aside. So one of the things about the solution that I think can be attractive, particularly for the people who come up with it, is it kind of makes us important of if I tell you that there are these two categories and they're really different and if you get them wrong, you're gonna be in trouble, I kind of make myself important of you've gotta to come to me if there's some ambiguity in the situation and say, well, is, does this fit into category A or category B? And you gotta come on Discord, you gotta reopen an issue or you gotta have me consult with you. Versus if we dissolve the problem, then I become hopefully a lot less important of this just works and you don't really even think about it. The best case scenario is really that this works and you never think about it at all and the person who comes up with a dissolution is the unsung hero here. So okay, we talked about referential transparency. Let's talk about another example, type classes. So this chart is totally clear, right? We've got a bunch of cats, some of them have collars, someone seems to have a voodoo doll, there are like 10 things here. We all know exactly what's going on with this, right? Maybe not so much. So type classes are another thing that there's definitely things to be said in their favor, but another thing that can be a barrier to accessibility. 
we go back to that learning staircase, how many things do you need to learn to be productive if your functional effects are encoded using these type classes? Well, a lot, right? You need to learn a lot about how these implicits work in Scala and how type classes work and how they're encoded and all these things. So you're just creating a lot more steps on the stairway that you need to climb before you can solve whatever your actual problem is. They also can privilege a narrower group of people. So uh, Don Syme, the designer of F Sharp, had a really good discussion earlier this year where he talked about this idea that being very focused on these type classes and category theory can really disempower a lot of people where kind of the only person who has authority to speak is the one who's the category theorist. And I think that more theoretical perspective has a lot of value, but one of the things I've really appreciated in the Zio community is we've gotten the solutions by bringing together a lot of different perspectives of that perspective, of a perspective on ergonomics, a perspective on concurrency, a perspective on performance, and all of those come together. And so what this <laughs> turns to be in person, when you don't have this, when you have this very type class-led uh, functional effects system is you've got a user who maybe they've taken their Python course, they're coming to Scala, they want to do some of the things that are the real world things they got to do with Python. And they're like, well, how do I scrape some web data? And we come to them and we say, well, you know, let me tell you about type classes and let me tell you about implicits and how they're encoding Scala. Then let me tell you about the functor hierarchy. And then let me tell you about this other hierarchy that we've developed for different type classes for effects versus other things. Then let me tell you about monad transformers, and okay, now you can finally go and scrape your web data. And that's like, okay, now we've got, now we've got a real cliff here. And this, is, this has been a real problem for Scala historically. And I think fortunately we're starting to get more resources like Zio HTTP that we're gonna be hearing about later in this conference to make this <laughs> less of a barrier, but it's been a real problem. And the other thing we can see about type classes with some of the tools we've talked about here is that they're another example of a solution versus a dissolution. So they break the world up into these very specific categories, right? I think we saw like 10 different categories on that one chart and there were really more than that because there are different permutations of them. So there are these very specific categories. We get very specific data types and operators to deal with each of them. And so on the one hand, the good thing is we've got all these specific data types and operators and we can very precisely describe the type of effect involved, but we also have to very specifically describe the type of effect involved. So here's like a very simple example of this. So let's say I want to compute pi to some precision. And so I've got this method here that's going to let me specify what precision do I want, right? How many decimal places do I want to compute it to? And this is gonna use this monad cancel thing, which says this can be canceled. So I'm gonna have the ability to, as this thing is computing, 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 I'm gonna say, you know what's taking too long, cancel it, I don't care about super precise pi anymore. And then I decide, well, you know what, I wanna make this a little bit more efficient. I've got all these cores on my computer, I can get them all working together. I can have each of them contributing to the calculation of this precise version of pi. And what happens here? I we'll have to change my type signature. I have to change it from this monad cancel thing to this spawn thing, because now I'm using forking fibers to do this, instead of just saying, well, it's something I can cancel. So the fact that I changed this implementation detail has now forced me to change my method signatures. And if something else is calling, I'm gonna have to change those method signatures too. So it's another problem. Again, if, you, if this is what you're trying to solve, then great, but if not, less than ideal. And this is really that, where that fundamental idea of a dissolution comes in, of, right, it's not that I'm not lazy, I just don't care. I don't care whether it spawns fibers internally or not. I just care about calculating pi. And so again, here's the Zio version of those methods, and they're exactly the same. Because from the perspective of Zio, we dissolve this problem by having one effect type that has all of these capabilities built in. So those 10 different things are 10 different things you don't have to think about. 
there's one thing that does all those things, and you can think about whether it's a ZO or not a ZO, but that's it. And now our method signature doesn't have any of those implementation details. Okay, so now you're, maybe you're like, Adam, okay, that's fine, but you're, you're being a little mean here, you're making fun of people, so okay, let, let, let's turn it inward, right? Let's, let's have some friendly fire, and in my case, we'll have the, the friendliest of fire, you might say, because this has is something that I was, I was involved with the development of, so let's, let's look inward here. So, if you're familiar with ZO 1.0, you're probably familiar with a signature like this. This is how we define services in ZO 1.0. And it was a little weird. We had this, like, if you wanted to define this logging service, you, like, had to define in a separate package, and then you had to define this type alias for this has thing, and then, like, your actual interface couldn't just be the, like, name, it had to be the service within the object, and then finally you got to define your service. And this was another barrier to accessibility. It was one more thing that always had to be explained, right? You think about the staircase. Every time I want you to climb the staircase of like learning about dependency injection, first I have to say, well, let me tell you about has. Anytime, well, let me tell you about, it's maybe a problem. And we just saw it led to these very unidiomatic patterns for service definition. And it created this issue that it was hard to tell which things were has versus which ones were not. And Kit, to his credit, he did a very wonderful video about this of I can has and so can you. And you can even see some of our other compatriots here if I think Ash and Damien were on the line for this, I think I was. And so it was a, it was a great video. But the fact that we needed it was itself an indication of this problem, of this being one more thing that you had to learn. So one of the things I want us all to hopefully think about is when you see a great talk or you give a great talk, like fantastic, celebrate that, but also think about what would it take to make that something that was of a little more academic interest, where this wasn't something that you like need to know to be productive, but just you can, you can do perfectly fine without this, but you know, if you want to know a little more, here's the, here's the resource for you. So here's what the same thing looks like in ZO 2.0. So has has been completely deleted. I'm not sure everyone is kind of up to date on this for ZO 2.0. Has is gone. And you have the same ability to compose the environment. And the pattern for defining services here is now almost so obvious and boring, it's like not even worth having a slide on. I mean, it's like, yeah, the way you define an interface is you have a trait in Scala. Like, of course, there's really almost nothing to note about that. And as we said, we have all the same abilities. So it's, it's definitely a huge win in terms of user ergonomics. And it's another example of this idea of dissolution versus solution. So previously we had these two categories of things, right? There was the category of has things, and there was the category of non-has things. And you needed to keep track of them. You needed to know which thing was a has thing and which one was not a has thing, and when you needed a has thing versus when you didn't need a has thing. And by deleting this, we just mean there's one less thing to learn. So it makes it a lot easier to get people climbing up that stairway. Here's another one. Again, let's look inward. Manual layer construction. So manually constructing layers was a barrier for accessibility. The time we did this, we, were, we, we thought we had something really great where we had these two fundamental operators. We had this triple arrow that kind of said, take the output of one layer and provide it to another. We had this plus plus that says, create both of these layers together and provide both of these services to your effect. But I think we learned over the course of ZO2 point, of ZO1 that that arrow syntax was not as ergonomic. It was another example of one more thing that people had to learn, right? You learn your flat maps, your maps, your zips, and now we say, well, there are these different triple arrow and plus plus things. Had very poor error messages, especially with has. And it was another one more thing you had to learn, right? You kind of learn your ZO, you're ready to like, 
run your program, you just need to wire up your dependencies, and now it's like, oh, well, okay, now I have to learn this other thing. And looking back, it's another very classic example of this solution versus dissolution. And in this case, I actually went back and John and I gave a talk last year, and it was called uh, Z-Layer is a solution to the dependency injection problem. And I think at the time, I didn't realize how apt that title was, that it was a solution and not a dissolution. And so it definitely had things to be said in its favor. It broke the world down, these two categories of parallel and sequential composition of dependencies. It gave you operators for working with both of them. You could use it to construct complex dependency graphs. And so we definitely got things out of it. If you understood this and you really kind of grasped that, I think you did see like at a very fundamental level this idea of building the dependency graph and representing the dependency graph as data. You got composable, type safe, resource safe construction of these. So that you definitely got something there. And you could very precisely describe the construction of your dependencies. You could say, well, I want to build this, and then I want to build this, and then I want to build this other thing, I want to build that whole thing in parallel, and you could do all that exactly the way you wanted. But I think the reality is that people don't want to solve the dependency injection problem. They wanted the dependency injection problem to go away. Probably the, the only person who really wanted to use all these tools was Kit when he was developing the automatic layer construction to actually make this go away. And so in ZO 2.0, this all just becomes, you have your effect, and you call provide, and you just give it all the layers you're interested in. And notice I just gave it a list of layers here. I didn't have to specify any order of them, any relationship between them. ZO itself analyzes the structure of the dependency graph and puts all these together in the right way. It sees that, well, the logging layer here needs a console dependency. And, well, I've got that in the console layer, so I can put all that together. It automatically builds those in the correct order. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Definitely round of applause for Kit. And it gives you these really helpful error messages if one of these layers has a missing service. So it's, real, it's really nice. It's a real step forward. And it's an example of a dissolution of the problem, right, of you essentially we just say, don't worry so much about this complexity of building these layers. Put everything in, and either if it's got everything it needs, we'll build it, or if it doesn't, we'll tell you what's missing, and you can give us that too, and then we'll build your whole thing. And so I think this is a good example of some of the challenges of getting there and the process of doing that. So in this case, it required challenging this premise of not using macros. I think in Scala 2, macros have sometimes been overused, they've been used in poor ways, and so there's this idea that, well, we, we want to use vanilla Scala. And I think it really required both surfacing that assumption and challenging that to say, well, okay, maybe that's true, but is that always true? How can macros be used in a productive way here? How can we avoid some of those pitfalls here? In this case, it also required a different person than the original developers, right? It required Kit to come in here and kind of say like, hey, this isn't working and I'm gonna do something different. And I don't think that's always the case. Sometimes maybe the original developers can kind of really challenge themselves and step back, but I think sometimes it requires at least a new perspective and sometimes that perspective does come from someone else. And it required putting that ego aside of us not saying, well, people just need to learn layers better or oh, we're just, we just don't want macros at all, but to really hear the feedback and be willing to do something new. And I think with all those things together, we got to a really good place for Zio users for Zio 2.0. Okay, so one more here. Blocking. So how many of you have heard statements like this? We need separate core and blocking thread pools. Yeah. We have to carefully distinguish blocking from non-blocking effects. Yeah. We need to only run blocking effects on the blocking thread pool. Yeah. I think we've all said that. I think we've all heard it. I know I've said it at various points in time. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this is another example, if we think about it, of a solution. 
So, right, it divides the world up into these two categories. It says there are these two categories of blocking things and non-blocking things. And it's gonna give us appropriate tools to deal with each of them. And so in this case, we're gonna say, well, if it's non-blocking, then you just don't do anything. And if it's blocking, then in Zio, you have to use this specific blocking constructor, or in Zio 1.0 is a blocking service that deals with this thing. And so like other solutions, that requires that we identify the, and use the appropriate tool each time. And this has the same problems that all the other solutions we've talked about have had. That fundamentally, I don't think users really want to solve the blocking problem. No one ever like started their day and is like, you know what, I want to build something that is going to solve the blocking problem. Like they want to like, they want to do their Kafka, they want to write their web service. They maybe not even, don't even realize that blocking is a problem they need to deal with until they either get shot in the foot by it or someone tells them, well, you need to worry about this thing. So from the user perspective, this problem probably wasn't even on their radar at the beginning. And really the best case you could tell the user is that this problem is just gonna go away. Like the best case for them is just, they get to go back to the status quo before they even learn this was an issue for them. In addition to this, it really creates an issue of safety of, you, know, you think about that staircase and we said, well, we want people to be able to stop, climb the staircase incrementally but we also want each of those steps on the staircase to be safe for you to be able to be productive at each step without having to get all the way to the top, top of the staircase. And this creates a real problem for that because like, I was having a conversation with a distinguished engineer at one of the organizations I work with and we're talking about this and he, he said, well, do we have any blocking code in our code base? And it's a large, large code base. Do we have any HP requests that block? And I kind of had to say, well, I can't tell you for sure. Like, I can say if you use something like ZOHCP and you do it the right way, then it should be done non blocking and so on, but you got a lot of HTTP calls in your application. <laughs> it's hard for me to say in the abstract that all of those are done in the right way. And if you get the wrong answer to that, it can have a really negative impact, right? If I've got eight cores on my machine and I'm accidentally blocking with two of them, I've just lost 25% of my processing capacity. And if I do too much blocking, I may deadlock my application entirely because I may have all eight of those cores blocking on something. I may have no one to actually do work that's gonna unblock them. So let's go back to our methodology of how we get, so the good thing is we've got a solution here. We've got an existing solution. We know it has the issues that solutions have. We'd like to just be able to dissolve this problem. How do we get from here to there? Well, first step is surfacing the premises. So what are the premises that underlie this idea that we have to separate out these things? Well, first one is this idea that a fixed thread pool is more efficient. Second one is this idea that an unbounding thread pool is necessary for blocking operations. We may just get more and more blocking operations to come in, we need to be able to just keep spinning up more and more threads to deal with them. And the third one we could say is that it's not possible for the framework to distinguish these two. That as far as the framework's concerned, these are just two arbitrary blobs of code. So we don't have any way to distinguish them, so that's why the user has to tell us. That's why the user has to use this blocking operator to indicate this is something that needs to be run on the blocking executor. Okay, so now that we've surfaced those premises, we can start to evaluate them in a little more of a fact-based versus intuitive way. So first one was this idea that a fixed thread pool was more efficient. And that one, I think, is actually correct. Uh, it, it was true in, even in Zio 1.0 and in Zio 2.0 with the development of the fiber aware scheduler, there's actually even more benefit to running on a small number of threads in terms of minimizing cost of context switches, in terms of maximizing cache locality. So as much as we want to challenge things, <laughs> we've also got to <laughs> run up against reality. So, okay, seems like that's actually correct. Second one's this idea that unbounded thread pool is necessary for blocking. That also seems like it's correct, that as we, if we just get 100 different blocking requests in, 
if we want to process them immediately, we just got to spin up more threads for them. It's the third one here. It's not possible for the framework to distinguish between these two. Well, that has some intuitive appeal. We, I, I said a minute ago that for the runtimes like Zio, when you have these two effects, they're just essentially blocks of code, right? If, if you have a printout of Zio, it's just like a flat map lambda, and it's like, okay, it's a bunch of gibberish, essentially. So what are we gonna do with that? But we could also start to think about that a little more and maybe challenge that of, why can't we distinguish them? At one level, okay, it is arbitrary code, that's true. But we've also got some tools we could potentially bring into play. So one is we get to observe that code as it runs. So if I wanted to, I could look at it, I could look at the thread that's running it, I could see is that thread blocking, I could see something else about that thread state, I could see something else potentially about whether that is making progress. We've also now got a bunch of tracing and metrics. So it's not entirely an arbitrary block of code. I know where that block of code was forked from. I know what line of code it came from. So I'm starting to have more tools here. So we can start to say, well, maybe this isn't, maybe this is a technical versus a fundamental problem, that this is something that we could do something about, we've got to figure it out, but is not just a insurmountable problem. And so let's, let's build on that. So in the fiberware scheduler, we already keep track of something we call the op count, which is how many operations a worker has completed. And we use that for some essentially bookkeeping type stuff of after a certain number of iterations, then we check the global queue for fairness, we do other things like that. So we could take that and we could say, well, if the op count hasn't increased over a certain interval, then that means that we're blocking essentially, that either we're actually blocking, that we're, the thread is physically blocking somewhere, or the thread is doing something that is CPU bound, that is taking up so much of its time that it's not yielding back to the runtime. And we could potentially create a new worker at that point and shift the existing tasks there. So what do we think of that initial approach? Well, it, it's already got some things to be said for it. So it turns blocking from a safety to an efficiency issue. So just with what I described, we could no longer have a program that deadlocks if we accidentally do blocking work on the asynchronous thread pool. And it does that without compromising the efficiency of existing asynchronous operations. So the one problem with that strategy is that if we have a lot of blocking work, we can be slower in doing that work because we have this cost that we have to incur every time we want to identify a blocking operation. Because we've got to observe it at least once and then observe it again and see that it hasn't made progress and then we've got to shift everything. We're not able to just immediately know that it's blocking and immediately spin up a new thread like we could if we use the blocking operator in the old world. But we might then ask ourselves, what if we could amortize that cost over time by learning? And so one of the things I mentioned a minute ago is that we've got this ability now to track the location that a fiber was forked from. So we've now said that at some cost I can identify whether a particular fiber is blocking by observing whether it's made progress over a period of time. And we know where these fibers were forked from. So putting those things together, I could start to think about what percentage of the time did a fiber that was forked from a particular location block? And I could say, well, if fibers from this location have blocked more than a certain percentage of the time, then I'm just gonna treat them as blocking and I'm gonna immediately spin up that thread. And if I do that, then as soon as I learn that, then I can be just as fast as the traditional approach where I manually identify blocking. And so this leads to what we're calling adaptive scheduling, which is the next generation of innovation that we're pushing for in scheduling. 
And the idea here is that Z, the Zia runtime is continually learning as your application is running and adapting over time to make itself more efficient. And we think this is actually just the start of what we can do with the information that we have in the Zio runtime. So let's, if I can get this over, let's see what this looks like. This may be a little bit challenging for me with this. Yeah, let's see, and it's not. Uh -huh. huh. How is that, a little bit better? Okay, perfect. So what we've got here is a little bit of a blocking nightmare situation. So I've got, I'm forking 100 fibers and 99 of them are just gonna wait for this one shot, which is a blocking operation. And then the very last one is going to set the one shot to release all of those. And I'm gonna repeat that whole thing 100 times. So on something like Cat's Effect or on Zio 1.0, this whole thing would deadlock. It would deadlock the very first time, it would, <laughs> not to mention you're repeating it 100 times. But let's try and see what happens if we run it on Zio 2.0. Done. So this is something that we're just started, that is definitely the beginning of a journey we're gonna be taking here. I'm sure there's going to be uh, some things we're gonna have to work through on the way, but I'm really excited about what we can bring here and also, <laughs> let me see if I can get my slides back here. Maybe I'll just quit this, there we go. And let me, no, sorry. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so I'm really excited about bringing that to uh, Zia 2.0 and getting to the point where having to distinguish blocking like that is a thing in the past or at best a optimization you can do if you, you know, want to save the runtime, the work of identifying that. But I think that's the start of where we can go with uh, scheduling. So with that, I want to summarize a little bit. One of the things that's really important is we want to make the work we do with functional effects accessible for everyone. And I'd really encourage you to watch out for this, let me tell you about syndrome. Anytime someone asks you a question and instead of being able to answer the question, you say, well, let me tell you about this other thing. Sometimes it's necessary, but think about that as like a red flag for yourself and ask yourself, is that indicating that there's something that you can be doing differently in either the way you're solving the problem or the way you're educating people or potentially being able to dissolve the problem versus solve the problem to essentially not have to do that. And I think this idea of going from solution to dissolution is really powerful, of be proud of the solutions you've developed. And I think there are a lot of cases in Zio where we've developed the solution, we may not have developed the dissolution yet, but don't get too attached to those solutions. Keep thinking about how you try to take it from a solution to a dissolution. And as you're thinking about educating people, think it's great to educate people, but it's even better if what you're doing is so simple that they don't need to be educated, right? Think about that example of how we define services in Zio 2.0. Like, there's no point in me coming in, like, talking to you about, like, you should define a trait as a trait. Like, yes, obviously you should define a trait as a trait. You only need me to tell you about it if I'm going to tell you some weird way to do it that's, like, not the normal way to do it. And finally, challenge the reasons that can't be done. I think in most cases, if you say, well, this can't be done, you're likely to be on the wrong side of history. Unless you can like mathematically prove that something's impossible, you're likely to be on the wrong side of history if you say it can't be done. Maybe it can't be done now, maybe we don't know how to do it, but don't say it can't be done. So with that, I'd like to wrap it up here, and I'd like to thank John, Sandra, and Itamar, my uh, co-founders here at Zyverge. Uh, the rest of the Zyverge team, it's always a pleasure working with all of the Zio contributors and users, the conference sponsors who made this possible, and finally, all of you who are joining here, either in person or remotely. Thank you so much for your time, and it was a real pleasure being able to be with you today. <laughs>